Still 
Today, I want to uh, first thank you for, for coming and being part of, man, what a great revival, what a great time, uh, refreshing. Um, I was telling someone just a few minutes ago and told several, now it's just a matter of understanding that we keep that on a weekly basis. So when we're doing praise, when we're doing worship, the goal is, is not to run out in three weeks. The goal is that within a month from now, I don't have to, we don't have to do another one or another, in other words, to, to maintain that, what we do in worship every day, what we do in your reading every day, what you do, the goal is to say, you know what, I, I'm, I'm, I'm filled and, and I'm, I'm ready. Now, there will come a time again, hey, we need to have some meetings and have some more. That's great. But it shouldn't happen in three weeks. Look at the person beside you and say, you shouldn't have that big a hole in your cup. You may have a leak, but you should not be cracked all the way down the side to where it runs out 10 minutes after church. So, Understanding that, that that's the, that's the mindset. So now we're in revival. Now we're back fresh. We're back ready to go, inviting, dealing with issues. I want to speak today on uh, just a thought, and I don't do uh, holidays too well. I'm not a big holiday preacher as far as those things. 
But I want to preach today on the first Thanksgiving. Can, can I do that? Um, a lot of times history, especially now our, our reinvention of history, we just keep rewriting history and we change it to before long you'll think that America was not created by Christian people uh, when, when it was founded by nothing but Christian people. And so this is the whole purpose was religious persecution was the reason we came and founded and did all the things we did. You start to think that it was just business people and, and a few other people. And so I want to go back and I want to talk about the very first Thanksgiving. Now, this can be contradictory because what was the very first Thanksgiving? Uh, tell, me, tell me what sticks out to you when you think about Thanksgiving or the first Thanksgiving. Pilgrims, okay, they were what? Describe for me pilgrims. What kind of people? We're going to talk in just a second. I need, to, I need you to engage and wake up. Engage with me just a second, and then I'll get to preaching. Don't worry, I won't ask no more questions. So talk to me for a second. The, the pilgrims, and they were what? In fact, they were Puritans. They were Puritans. So that was their religious faith. So tell me, anybody know anything about Pur Puritans except they wore those real funny-looking hats? And they had those big belt buckles. What do you know about Puritans? Come on now, did anybody go to school? David, they, they even teach this stuff in school anymore? No, no, they don't. Well, I grew up at a time when stuff was taught. And so, so who were the Puritans? They were a religious group, very strict, very strict religious group. They did not associate with people. That was the whole point of coming and being separate because the England wanted them to be basically incorporated into the mother church of England and all this. And they were like, no, we are, we are separate. We are, we are uh, different. We're not going. So the Puritans and other religious groups transferred over. So this Puritan group, these pilgrims, as we always changed it to, the pilgrims. And, uh, and so they are one picture. What other picture do you get? What do you remember about Thanksgiving, the first Thanksgiving? Indians, of course, got to have Indians. So the Puritans were eating dinner with the Indians. And, and so that's the first picture that we have of, of Thanksgiving. That's what we kind of make plays about and, and different things. There's this one very religious, very strict group that is trying to find its way in this new world, and then there's this group that has always been there. They just there. It's, this is our world, and we live here. We know how to raise corn. We know how to raise. We we survive here. This is what we do. And the meeting of the two. So in 1621, we consider that to be the first Thanksgiving, where the Indians came. And that tribe of Indians who were traveling at that time, it would have been normal because it was not in November, at the end of November like it is now, freezing cold. It was more of a harvest festival, and it would have been happened in September. It would have happened in October. That would have been the time, September, October, would have been when this holiday, this celebration would have taken place. All the people were gathering. In fact, the very first Thanksgiving that you're thinking about, the one you're thinking about, happened because the Indians brought five deer that day. Do you know how many people were, were at that first celebration? There was only about 50 men. Four women had survived the trip. And there were multitudes, a bunch of kids. Along, in fact, they say the Indians would have outnumbered them almost five to one. So this small group of people are gathered together, celebrating a festival with the Indians. But really that wasn't the Thanksgiving because that Thanksgiving you're thinking about was only written in history by two different people. Only two people ever wrote about it in history. It was written in two different letters. In fact, one barely mentioned it, and the other one wrote a whole four sentences about it. Only four sentences, sentences, let me get my tongue going, about the very first Thanksgiving that we celebrate. I mean, we, we blow it out. They wrote four sentences about it. That's it. In fact, it wasn't even considered a great 
celebration. The Thanksgiving of 1623, by the same writers, wrote paragraphs about that Thanksgiving. Now, that Thanksgiving was different because that Thanksgiving in 1623 was the year that there was a drought. And the year that there was a drought, almost a month of no rain, they began to pray. They began to fast. They began to have prayer meetings. God, we're not going to make it if you don't do something, if you don't help us. And historians that wrote of that time said, the rain began, and for 14 days, it was a slow, steady rain that replenished the earth at that time. It was so exciting that they had a Thanksgiving celebration. Some historians say that isn't even the first Thanksgiving. The first Thanksgiving did not uh, have Indians, did not have, but the first Thanksgiving happened in Virginia, 11 years earlier. And it wasn't a feast. This one was in November, a little bit later. It was in 1610. This happened in Jamestown when it had been reduced from 409 people who started the settlement. In Jamestown, Virginia, 409 people had started the settlement, but in 1610, the cold, the winter, the whole situation was so bad that they were down to 60 people that was all left living. The survivors began to pray for help because they didn't know where their help would come from. They didn't know if ships could come in. They didn't know if they would have anybody arrive. They, did, they just began to pray, God, you've got to help us. You've got to send something. When help finally arrived in the form of a ship and filled their food supplies and their pantries and this, listen, a prayer meeting was held to give thanks to God. And it was considered the first thanksgiving in America. So when people say, well, it's got nothing to do with God, it has everything to do with God. Why would the Puritans, why would these people be thankful? Why would they be, well, because this isn't even the first Thanksgiving. The first Thanksgiving happens about 2,000 years earlier. The first Thanksgiving that takes place happens between a group of religious people and a group of normal people who live in that area who, who this is their normal culture. Now I want to show it to you. I want you to see the very first Thanksgiving that ever took place for me and you. Go with me in your Bibles to Acts 10, beginning at verse 47. Acts 10, beginning at verse 47. This is Peter speaking... And I'll tell the story, but let me just go ahead and read the scriptures. Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him to stay for what? They asked him to stay for a few days. The first Thanksgiving lasted how long? Three days. That celebration, the first Thanksgiving, took three days. Beginning at verse 1 of chapter 11 now. Let's keep going all the way to 11.3. Now the apostles and brethren who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had received the word of God. And when Peter came to Jerusalem, those of the circumcision contended, but they were not happy. Those back in Judea, Jerusalem, they were not happy that Peter had done this. Saying, you went to the uncircumcised men and you went to the uncircumcised men and you hung out. You ate together. You celebrated. The first Thanksgiving that ever took place happened because a religious group 
had to finally come to grips with a native tribe. The religious group, though, in that time was the Jewish people. The Jewish people were this very staunch religious people. They were very, just like the Puritans, they had very strict rules, very strict religion. You know, in the Puritan church, someone stood at the back with a stick. Their services would last up to three to five hours. Y'all get mad at me. I should have been a Puritan. It would have been good. I would have never had to ask you, you think we could go a little bit? No, it'd just be like, I got something else I want to talk about. And someone would stand at the back of the stick, and if anyone began to... His job was to make sure you did not. There are several other... You can study the Puritans, and, and, and I ain't got time to go into the, all the history, but that learn a little history. They were a very strict, staunch... I mean, they, they were a tough group. That's why they called themselves Puritans. They wanted to be pure. And they were determined to get there. Much like the Jews of this time in our Bible... Much like these people, they were determined we are going to be pure. We're going to live our lives. We're going to do it and we're going to show God how holy we are and how religious we are and we're going to show God how committed we are. And they had not only just taken the laws that God had given, but they had created new laws. They had created other things, traditions that made themselves feel really good, that made themselves feel really holy. And so the Puritans, just like this group, have established these things. So now let's start in chapter 10. And I'm not going to read any of it, but I'm just going to tell you the story. There is this group represented by Cornelius who is outsiders. They are, they are Gentiles. That's you and me. They're Gentiles. They don't fit in the group. They, they're not connected. They're not part of it. They don't have the right bloodline. They don't have the right history. They don't have the right heritage. They're the wrong color, the wrong shape, the wrong size, they're the wrong everything. And so it begins with this Cornelius who is a good man, a devout man, who believes in God but doesn't know how to go any further. The Bible says that an angel of the Lord appears unto Cornelius. Cornelius is scared. He's like, oh, what did I do? No, no, you, you haven't done anything wrong. You've, you've done good. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to send three men, so you send three of your servants, and I want you to go to Joppa. And there at this certain house, he tells them exactly which house to go to, the, and, and he tells them exactly where you'll find this man, Peter. He said, you send these people down and find this man, Peter. He will be at this house. He'll be located here. I mean, he gives him exact details. And he says, you tell him that he's supposed to come and preach to you. He's supposed to come to your house. And so he does. But what's happening in the meantime is that about that same time in Joppa, Peter is up on top of the roof and he's having his moment of prayer. This would have happened at about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. What happened to Cornelius at 3 o'clock at the hour of prayer is the same thing that's happening to Peter at 3 o'clock at the hour of prayer. Same time, the Holy Spirit is working in two different regions. And as Peter's praying, Peter starts having visions. The visions are of this blanket that comes down. This, this big old blanket has four corners. And as it's coming down, Peter's thinking, okay. But he notices as it's coming down what's on it. There are all types of animals. There's all types of four-footed beasts. There's unclean animals. There's crawling creatures. There's, I mean, there's probably some shrimp on it, some gumbo. I mean, it's, it's, it's all kind of stuff. It's on this thing. You got a couple pigs running around. You got, you got all this type of and, and they're alive. Unclean, can't touch it. They're alive. And when the blanket comes down, God speaks to him and says, Arise, kill it, and eat it. And Peter's like, no, 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 no. You, you, God, I have not eaten any of this all of my life. I have, I have been pure. I have been. And God says, what I have called clean, don't call it 
unclean. Don't call it nasty. Don't call it unworthy. And Peter says this happened three times. Three times this vision took place. Blanket comes down. I see all these animals. Rise, kill it, eat it. No. Finally, about a day later, here comes these men knocking on the door. They're Gentiles. We're looking for Peter. And they're like, you're at the wrong place. No, 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 we're looking for Peter. And Peter comes to the door and says, well, who are you? And they explain to him that our master has sent us and Cornelius has seen a vision and all these things. And, and he says, I'll go. Because God had untold him to go. And when he gets to Cornelius' house, when he gets to the place, it's, it's kind of unique. Uh, Cornelius meets him and greets him. Cornelius falls at his face before Peter. And Peter immediately gets him and grabs him and says, no, no, stand up. I'm a man just like you are. Peter is learning this connectivity. He's, he's starting to figure it out. He's starting to realize that, okay, God is not caring about my tradition. Because understand now, there is no, no law, because Peter begins his sermon by saying this. Peter says, now you know that it's unlawful for me to be in this house as a Gentile, I'm, uh, as a Jew, I'm not supposed to be in this house. Do you know there was no such law? It was a tradition. They had taken the law of God and they had created all these other barriers to keep themselves separated so that they did not have to connect and did not have to... In fact, historians would say, we are separate in life and we're separate in bed. In other words, we don't hang out with you and we ain't marrying you. And Peter looks at him and says, I'm not supposed to be here. But I'm figuring out that God is no respect of person. And he begins to preach. He begins to, to go through the story. Go with me in Acts 10, and let's go back to about verse 30. Acts 10, verse 30. So Cornelius said, four days ago I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard, and your alms are remembered in the sight of God. Now this is what he's sharing to Peter. He's saying, look, I'm telling you what's happening. I don't understand all this. I don't realize how all this is falling together, but I just know what happened to me. Send therefore to Joppa and call Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon the tanner at the sea. When he comes, he will speak to you. He said, all I know is that I'm supposed to bring you here. And when you get here, you're supposed to be speaking to me. You are supposed to be telling me something that I don't know. You are supposed to be bringing something to me I don't know. Then Peter so I sent immediately, have you come? Now, therefore, we are all present before Cornelius says, I have invited all my friends. I have invited my family. I have invited everybody dear to me. In fact, when Cornelius first gets this vision, the Bible says that he calls to him select people, his servants and people that are closest to him, and, and just basically says this, y'all think I'm crazy? Because this is what I just saw. And they said, no, we believe you. And so he's, he's, he's invited all these people that are close to him, his family, his servants, all the people that 
know that Cornelius is an honest man and that he's sharing the truth. And so he says, now to hear all the things commanded you by God. In other words, whatever happens now has to happen because you have an order from God to do something. If you want to have the great thanksgivings in your life, I know we're fixing to go celebrate, we're fixing to go spend time with family, but I'm going to tell you what will create the great thanksgiving of your life is that when each person comes and brings what they're supposed to bring to the celebration, what each person is supposed to bring, when you go out of these four walls, what is it you are supposed to bring? What have you been commanded to do? The Bible says to go into the highways and hedges and compel them to come. That's a commandment that you're supposed to have. The Bible says to speak truth, to tell them the story, to preach with boldness. We've talked about that over the last. We've had revival to, to set us up for the fact that our job is to leave this place today and to speak boldly the truth of God, to speak about who Jesus is, to speak. If you don't know what you're supposed supposed to speak, then I can help you out. You say, brother, I'm not good at that. Well, then I'll just help you out because at the first Thanksgiving that ever took place, here's what happened. Then Peter, verse 34, opened his mouth and said, in truth, I perceive that God shows no so the first thing you got to do is that that cousin that's been married four times, has got tattoos, got all messed up, you got to realize he is loved by God just like you are. You're going to have to get it in your head that that person that, that doesn't fit, doesn't look, doesn't act, God sent you to minister and to speak because to God, he doesn't have any partiality. Peter is figuring it out that my job is to preach it. My job is to live it. My job is to proclaim it. My job is to, to stand out and to tell them the good news of the gospel. I am not into who gets it, who doesn't get it. We don't get all caught up. I don't know why one person can hear the gospel and get saved and somebody else hear the gospel and stick their nose up. I don't know. That's not my responsibility. I am just understanding that there is no partiality, that God doesn't care about color or race or background or anything else. He just is looking for somebody to proclaim the gospel to every living, breathing thing that exists on the earth. That's our job. Our job is not to live till 90. Oh, but a lot of it don't look like I'm going to make it to be 100. Well, whoop de doo You're dead anyway. If you're saved, you've already died to Christ, and you're not even living in this world. So what does it matter? If you live to 90, what's in this world you're trying to live to get to? You're a dead man walking. You only have one job. To proclaim the gospel to kids, grandkids, neighbor, co-worker, anybody you got until the day God either comes or until God says, it's time for you to come. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Untruth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, he means in the Gentile nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is acceptable to what? So when I preach the gospel, I'm not preaching a watered-down gospel. I've heard commentators when they when they quote this and they speak about this. I want to hear what other commentary, and they'll, they'll quickly water it down. Well, what he's trying to say is if those that will believe in Jesus Christ, that's not what he says. He says, he says, those who fear him and those who have a mindset that says that from today, I want to do right and not do wrong anymore. So when I'm speaking to somebody, here's what I'm speaking and the understanding of. Look, what I'm asking is today, do you fear God? Do you understand there is a God and you're going to have to meet him and you're ready to come to grips with that? And secondly, are you ready to whatever's not right in your life? Are you willing to lay it down and walk away from it? I don't, I don't want to hear after church, I, I, I pray with somebody. Let's say I pray with some young lady. I pray with her and it's like, I'm giving my life to God and I'm just want to surrender. And I'm like, praise God and all this. And then immediately after church, she comes down and says, now, brother, Lott, you know, I'm living with so-and-so and, 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 and you think God understands that. And, you know, I can't hardly pay my bills. And I'm like, you need to get out of that house. And usually I never see them again. Why? Because what I want is I just want to be forgiven and I want to keep doing what I'm doing. But listen, the mindset is, is that if I come to God, he's God. 
He is God. He is in charge. He is the one that's going to either take care of me or not. And I have to make a determined decision that I am going to follow him no matter what pain it starts with because coming out of my junk, it will be painful. It will cost. It will take. And he says, when I make that choice, two things. Do I fear God more than I fear what people think? And do I love God enough to lay down whatever God doesn't like? Peter says, I have perceived that God's no respect of person. And when he says that, he means this. That anybody, whoever they are, if they fear me and want to do right, then they're a candidate. For what? The word which God sent to the children of Israel preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is, this is the message. He is Lord of all. So if you don't know what to say at Thanksgiving, you need to start writing these things down. This is the way you learn how to witness to people. If you, if you say, I'm not good at witnessing, just write what I'm telling you. Number one, you look at them eye to eye and you say, look, if you fear God and you're ready to do right, we can, we can have a conversation. Do you fear God? Ready to do right? Then we can have a conversation. Okay, I am. Well, good then you know that from the time Israel was created and started that this gospel has been preached and finally perfectly preached through who? Jesus Christ, who is now Lord of all. There is no president bigger than him. There's no Congress bigger than him. There's no other government bigger than him. There's nothing in this world bigger than him. He is Lord of all. That word to you which was proclaimed through all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism of John preached. So he's saying, you know these things. Now you may have to look at this person and say, have you heard some of the stories? That's why we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So if you're preaching to someone and somebody says, well, where do I need to start reading? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Why? Because the very first thing he says, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was. He said, this is the message. That God sent Jesus, and in power and authority, he healed the sick, raised the dead, shook hands with lepers, walked on water, told storms to calm down. How, how far you want to go? Which story you want to pick? Women that are carrying their their sons out to be buried, he stops the funeral and raises them from the dead. How how powerful you want to talk about him? That's how powerful he is. He's even more powerful than that, not just his life, but listen. And we all are witnesses of the things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. He said, not only did he do what he's supposed to do, he followed it through to the very end. He was killed. Now, he doesn't go into who the Jews were and the Romans and Pontius Pilate. He said, just know the story. He gave his life, died on a cross. Him, God raised up on the third day and showed him If you're going to believe this, then let me tell you how the story goes. This same Jesus that was prophesied in the Old Testament, who lived just a few years ago, you heard about him, Cornelius. We saw it. We were there. You heard the stories. But we we saw everything, and we're here to tell you that it was all true. That he did raise the dead. That he did die on a cross. But on the third day, Cornelius, Cornelius, he also rose from the dead. Him God raised on the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before God. He said he didn't just come walking back preaching in the streets again. He said, but he appeared unto many people, over four to five hundred people, 
during a 40-day moment that he was on the earth before his ascension, and he spent 40 days showing himself. He said, we didn't just see him, but listen to what it says. But to witness chosen before God, even to us who ate and drank with him, when? After he arose from the dead. Hmm, I wish I had time to go to the, to the Last Supper. Because Jesus says to them, I won't eat or drink again until I do it in the kingdom. Peter says that after he rose from the dead, we ate and drank with him. So what does that mean? Where's the kingdom? Hey guys, you're living in the kingdom. That's a different sermon. <laughs> Don't get my mind going. That's a different sermon. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is he who was ordained by God to judge the living and the... So if I'm talking to somebody, that's, that's the message. Do you fear God? Are you ready to change? Well, I guess. Well, you better be. Because here's the deal. This Jesus that was preached in the Old Testament and used in stories is the same Jesus that came and lived and did the miracles. We saw him. He died. They killed him. Couldn't keep him dead. Three days later, God the Father raised him from the dead. And when he raised him from the dead, we ate dinner with him. And we were a part of everything that it is. And he, it's he who was commanded by God to be preached that Jesus Christ, that in the name of Jesus, you have salvation. And there's no other one that you can go to because he and he alone will be the one when you die. It won't be some president. It won't be Bill Gates. It won't be some other government. But you will stand before Jesus Christ because he is the one who is the one who judges now the living and will one day judge the To him, all the prophets, wit prophets witnessed that. Through his name, whoever believes in him will receive. If, you don't know, if you don't, you're not good at witnessing, you can take that one sermon that Peter preaches and break it down, and you can become one of the most powerful witnesses in, in the city of Forest in Scott County. Now, it'll sound a lot different than some Greg Lowry I'm sorry, some of these folks just irk me. If you'll just confess that you believe in Jesus, I'm like, y'all don't even understand the story. You don't grasp it. It ain't whether you believe. There's going to be people put Christmas trees out that ain't got no desire to believe. They'll have a manger scene. They'll watch Christmas movies. They'll even watch The Passion of the Christ. But this is the message that you have to believe that he is who he says he is, that all the prophets witness that through that name. Whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. Believe that he's Lord of all. He is God. He is, he is it. That's what saves us. And when we grasp that, something miraculous happens. Listen, while Peter was still, Peter ain't even finished his sermon. Peter's still talking about, he is, he is rolling, man. He is, he is fired up. He said, this, I'm telling you this, and let me tell you about what Jesus did. And Jesus is the king, and if you're going to receive, you got to receive through him. Man, he is, he is preaching it. And while he's preaching it, while Peter was still speaking, this, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. Not his word, not a word, but heard. The reason we don't see all we want to see most of the time is because we preach a word, but we don't preach the word. We don't want to offend anybody. We don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. We don't put them in an uncomfortable situation. 
Well, meeting the king is an uncomfortable situation when you realize you're not. And that's what meeting Jesus is. It's an uncomfortable situation where the day you realize I'm not in charge. It's not my life. It's not my future. If God chooses for me to die in a car wreck today, that's his choice. He, I'm his. I belong to him. Don't be sad. Don't be upset. Don't go crying and act like you ain't got no faith. There's nothing that can happen to Tim Lott without my master declaring that it must happen. And there's not one enemy that can come against Tim Lott that can succeed because my master is stronger, greater is he that's in me than anything that's in the world. So there's nothing that can take place in my life, good or bad, unless my master has determined that that's the course that I want for your life. If I could get the Christian church to understand that, we would be way ahead. That we just trusted that he is Lord of all. And Cornelius understands this. Cornelius grasps this. He, he knows that when Peter preaches this, and the people in the room who are servants, who understand this lifestyle, they understand, I know what I got to do. I believe it. And I don't know when it happened during Peter's message. I don't know how it happened during Peter's message. But somewhere during Peter's message, while he was still preaching it, somebody in their heart said, I believe it. I believe it. And when they said, I believe it, when that group said, we believe it, the Bible says the Holy Spirit fell. And those of the uncircumcision believed and were astonished of the circumcision, that six, there were six men, people that went with Peter. So you got the six with Peter, you got the three servants, so that was about 10 of them that traveled back to preach this gospel. And as many as came with Peter because of the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. This is the normal order of the pouring out of the Spirit, that there will be tongues. I'm sorry if that bothers you. Sorry, then write a new Bible. I don't know what to tell you. There's five times in the book of Acts, the power of God is poured out. Five times, you know what happens? They speak in tongues. I don't know how to tell you it any other way. Maybe you're by, you can find some preacher, well, that died out. And they ain't got no biblical, nothing for it. It just fits his theology because he don't want no part of the spirit. But biblically, when the spirit is poured out on someone, and they receive the baptism, there will be tongues. Now you're th- saying, bro, Lodge, you're pigeonholing God. No, God can do whatever he wants to do. I'm not trying to tell you that's. I'm just telling you that if I have to study the Bible and give you a scenario, then I can tell you that four out of four times, five out of five times, this is how it happens. So that's about a 100% chance. And I'm telling you, when you're seeking God and wanting more of God, that's what you're seeking. God, pour out your spirit on me. And if I'm saying pour out your spirit on me, then what I'm also saying is, God, give me the ability to pray in tongues. Give me the ability to speak. Give me the ability to empower me like you did Jesus. That's what Peter said, that Jesus of Nazareth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Was The power of God was poured out on him. And he said, that's the same thing that you've got to ask for. For they heard them speak with tongues, and in between their tongue talking, they would stop, and in English or in their Roman language, in their Greek language, they would begin to praise God just naturally. And they were, trans- they were going back and forth. One minute they'd be speaking in tongues, next minute they'd be speaking in their regular language. One minute, sound familiar? Still happens. Still happens. And here's the thing. I can actually tell you it's biblical. I actually have Bible for it. You may say, I don't believe that. Well, I can't help that. Well, I just don't understand. Well, I don't understand it all either. I just know that's the way I bet Cornelius to tell you, I don't understand any of this. But it didn't stop Cornelius from saying, I'll take it. If that's what it is, I'll take it. 
Cornelius didn't show up that day thinking, well, this is how I figure it's going to go. He had no idea. He was just open to whatever God had. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, can anyone, here's what I just read, can anyone forbid them from being baptized in water? So here's the thing. If you've received God, baptism is the next step to seal because now God has done it inwardly. Now baptism tells everyone outwardly that I am committed to God. That's what baptism is about. It's not about getting saved. You preach salvation, then you baptize. Do you understand what baptism, baptism is? Baptism is an open statement that you understood what Peter preached. It's an open statement that I believe that he is Lord of all, that he is in control of all, and that I am really ready to fear God and to follow him and to live the best that I possibly can through it. It's, it's a commitment. It's your de decision. So it'd be tough to say, okay, what's the first thing I need to be baptized? Well, I don't like being baptized. I'm not going to do that. What else do I need? It lets people know immediately that you weren't serious about the first thing. Because if the first thing God ever asks you to do is be baptized and you say no, then it already lets me know you didn't get saved. You didn't get saved. Oh, no, I asked God to forgive me. I know you did, but you didn't believe in him. Well, I believe, I, no, no, you didn't believe in him. Because you're not going to obey anything he's asking you to do. The first thing he ever asked you to do is get in the water and get baptized. Well, I don't want to mess up my hair. I don't, I don't like the way, I don't care. Yeah, have you ever seen that Homewood water? I know, it's bad. We did one the other day. If you, if you saw it in, 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 in bulk, you would wonder, why do we drink this stuff? But I've been drinking it for 30 years now. I'm still healthy and happy, and so it must not have anything bad. But it's, it's, it's a different color. It's a different color. You, you fill a baptistry, and you look at it. We drop chlorine tablets in it and everything, try to make it a little better. Can anyone forbid these that they should be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit, just as we have. And he commanded them to be baptized. Now, go with me to verse 4, or verse 3, 11 and 3. What has taken place is the very first Thanksgiving that ever took place in time. Immediately after their baptism, Peter spent days with them, staying at their place, sharing more, eating, and fellowshipping. It was the very first Thanksgiving. Two different cultures blended together, giving God thanks. But the religious world said, you went to the uncircumcised men and let me tell you what the hardest job the church will have over this next season. It's going to be hard to walk up and see guys dressed like women. That's going to be difficult. That's to run into people that don't even know whether they're a boy or a girl. They just use the they, the them pronouns because they ain't figured it out yet. It's going to be hard to walk up to people in our society who have so much baggage from their background. Multiple sex partners, maybe multiple marriages, children they know and some they don't even have contact with anymore. It's going to be hard to, to take what we are into a world of what they are and to share the gospel. It's going to be hard if we take it and we think we're going to do it from our own fleshly side. But the power of thanksgiving is simply this. It's being thankful that God is with us. 
It's being thankful that God will go before us. It's being thankful that God will give us power for greater is he that's in us. It's being what Peter is. Saying, I don't understand all this. I just know what I'm supposed to do. And then let God deal with the results. When I speak to that person that looks different, that acts different, that thinks different, I'm not there to judge them. I'm not there to try to condemn them. I'm just there to bring the gospel that God has given to me. This next couple of weeks, months, you're going to be in rooms with people that are of your family, people that are your cousins, friends, and they're going to think differently and they're going to act differently and they're going to throw things at you and they're going to think, well, what do you think of this? And what do you think of that? And and, and what do you say about it? And you only have one real job. To bring thankfulness. To bring thankfulness to the one who's looking to be thankful. It's not hard to be thankful. What's hard is to cross over boundaries that not God, but you have drawn in your life. It is for me. There's some situations I bump into and it's like, I don't want to get into that. Anybody ever get there? That cousin sits on the other side and they're talking crazy and you're just like, I'm just going to go in the kitchen and not, I understand, but that's not your job. Yeah, but they probably won't like me. Maybe, but they might get saved. And you'll never know unless you do it unless you stand, unless you proclaim it. See, really, that's what revival was all about, was for you to end up at the end being thankful. That's why Peter spent days with Cornelius, a people that's totally different. He ate things, I'm sure, that he thought, oh, Lord. They weren't even supposed to eat out of the same bowls. They weren't supposed to use the same utensils. They weren't, because maybe that thing touched some pork. Maybe that thing touched some type of meat that's, that's unclean. They, they, do you know that the Aseans, if they ever even went and hung out with Gentiles, they would immediately leave and go wash all their clothes and take a bath? But the first Thanksgiving brought the Gentiles in. The first Thanksgiving allowed the Gentiles to be part of the kingdom. And you can go to Jamestown in America, but that's still just a group of people who are thankful that God is taking care of them. Or you can go to the Puritans who are sitting there with Indians. And you know the one thing they said that took place? They gave thanks to God. In other words, the Puritans in front of those Indians, those other tribes, those other people, even though they are totally different people, there's one thing we have in common is that God is no respect of person. And that bridged a gap that even in America today we can't bridge. Because we can't figure out how to be equal and to be And the church can say, I can tell you how. At the cross, we all are equal. In the kingdom, there is no respect of person. No matter your background, no matter what you went through, no matter what you did, all you have to do is accept what Jesus has given and be part of the kingdom and part of the family. I don't know why this is so important to me to share today. But there's somebody that's going to be going into some situation and you need this. I don't know who you are. Maybe it's somebody I'm talking to online that's going to hear this message and think, wow, that's me. I got to go into some places this Christmas, this Thanksgiving. I got, and you've dreaded it. 
Well, just see yourself like Peter. Peter wasn't excited about it either. But look at the results. You never know what God's going to do with your stand. With just you proclaiming what you know. Let God then do the rest. You don't have to fix nobody. People asked me years ago what was the hardest part of creating all seasons or building all seasons. And, I, and that's simple. I can tell you in instant what was the hardest thing to take place at all seasons, and it, and it was me. I grew up from a background that if God saves them, then I'll fix them. If, if God will save them, then I'll tell them how to dress and I'll tell them why to not cuss and I'll teach them how to do this and I'll, 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 I'll teach them. Hardest season in life was when God said, Tim, I just need you to preach it and let me do the fixing. And I'd sit there and say, well, God, I'm, I'm just not sure. You don't think I can handle it? I'm not sure, God. Because they're just going to sit there in church and hear this word and ain't nothing going to happen. They're just going to sit there and keep sinning. They're just going to keep shacking up together. They're just going to keep living the way they live and they're just going to keep doing. And God, I, 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 I can't. Tim, do you think I'm strong enough? That was a hard question. I'm like, well, I know you are. Do you think I'm strong enough? Then just let me do what I do. One of the greatest things is to be standing at the back door and somebody walk by me and say, Pastor, I'm like, what? I hadn't smoked in three weeks. We never had a conversation. They never told me they were quitting. They never, And I just walk away many times and cry because I think how stupid I am to think God's not strong enough to fix what I can't fix. God says, I don't need your strength. I need your testimony. I don't need your strength. I need your testimony. And if someone like Cornelius is ready to hear it, it'll work. And if it's not, then you just planted a seed. But either way, you've done all you can do. If we got any parents in here, you understand that. It doesn't matter how much you teach them, how much you train them, how much you tell them, how much you want. Eventually, when they get big, they're going to do what they want. And you're going to blame yourself because you didn't do enough and you didn't. Eventually, it's just bigger than you. Eventually, somebody's got to walk with them and be in them that's bigger than you. And whoever you are that's listening to this today, I hope you have an awesome Thanksgiving. I hope you're not mean to anybody. I hope you're not ugly. I hope you don't just have a turn or burn t-shirt on. That's not what I'm saying. But I hope you walk in representing God in a world that needs to hear about God. And you just share the gospel and watch God do the rest. We just stand. The first Thanksgiving transformed the world as we know it. Maybe you can use this as an illustration. You can say, you know what the first Thanksgiving was? And you can go to this story. However you want to do it. But I'm going to be praying that souls get saved. That lives get changed from the people that my people meet over this next month or so. I'm praying for a harvest. We've already prayed for boldness to speak. We've already prayed for all those things, but now God just put us in the position. Put us in a place now, an uncomfortable place, 
an unfamiliar place. Like Peter sitting on the rooftop that looking at those pigs running around on that blanket and he's saying, I, I can't do this. Yes, you can, Peter. Don't call unclean what I call clean. Don't call dumb what I've called special. Don't call ugly what I've called beautiful. Just preach my gospel. Just share my gospel. And release me and my spirit to do what you can't do. Father, I pray that in the name of Jesus that will take place. That will break forth over these holidays. And I already give you praise for it, for the stories that I'll hear. The people that get to be prayed for, the miracles that take place. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. God bless you. Go give that devil fits.